Good afternoon, everyone. It is a great pleasure to welcome and introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. I mean, Con former Concord Judge L.B. Sachs. But before I do that, I'd just like to give a brief background of who he is. Now, in 1966, he went into exile. After spending 11 years studying and teaching law in England, he worked for a further 11 years in Maputo, in, Mo in Mozambique, as a law professor and legal researcher. In 1988, he was blown up by a bomb placed in his car in Maputo by South African security agents, losing an arm and a sight. Um, in 1990, he returned home and as a member of the Constitutional Committee and National Executive of the ANC and took an active part in the negotiations which led South Africa in becoming a constitutional democracy. In addition, in addition to his work on the court, he has traveled many countries, sharing South African experience in healing and in healing divided societies. It is with great pleasure to announce former Concord Judge Justice Amin Albi Sachs. I wonder how many of you can remember where you were on the 6th of April, 1952. <laughs> I was a 17-year-old second-year law student. How many of you are 17 years old or more? I guess just about all of you. And I mentioned that date. Is anybody in this room aware of why the 6th of April 1952 was an important date? It was actually a public holiday. It was celebrating the arrival on the 6th of April, 1652, of a certain Jan van Riebeek. And we used to learn at school, that was when South African history started, that was when white civilization came to darkest Africa, and it was now the 300th anniversary of that date. And the newly elected Africana nationalist government, made up of people, many of whom had supported Hitler during World War II, was celebrating. They had introduced a new word into the international vocabulary. It was called apartheid. In England they say apartheid. <laughs> and they officially sanctioned white supremacy as the policy of the country, in the Constitution, only whites could be elected to Parliament, in the law, in the Constitution, an affront to humankind. And the aeroplanes are flying overhead and the armoured cars are going through the streets and they are celebrating and there are about 200 of us in the Salt River Town Hall. Maybe 20% of the size of this hall. 190 black, maybe 10 white, and we're singing. And our songs were mostly very sad in those days. My boy, my boy, my boy, Africa. My boy, my boy. And then everybody would join in four part harmony. Beautiful, beautiful. A song that's still sung today, Senzenina, 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 and we'd all join in. And suddenly, 
Dr. Morocco, Dr. Dado, J.B. Marks, Katani Liver Puppy, volunteers obey the orders, be ready for the action now. Volunteers obey the orders. Volu- and they're calling for volunteers. It's the beginning of the defiance of unjust laws campaign. To defy the law that said every African man had to carry a passbook with him day and night if he couldn't present it on demand to a police officer, off to jail, off to jail, off to jail. For black people to be out on the streets after nine, half past nine in the cities at night without a letter from their master or madam, off to jail, off to jail, off to jail. For people sitting on seats marked whites only, whites only, even crossing bridges on the section marked whites only, go to jail, go to jail, go to jail. Six laws were chosen. And now black South Africa was rising up to defy these unjust laws. And they're calling for volunteers. And the singing is getting louder and louder. And I'm saying to my friend, a comrade, Wolfie Kodish, white person who'd fought against Hitler up north, I want to join. You can't. Why? Because you're white. We're fighting racism. It's a black struggle led by black people. But in December 1952, he'd reported it to the leadership. I led a group of four young white people to sit on seats in the general post office in the center of town, marked non-whites only. I've been telling this story quite often to generations who wonder, who were we? What motivated us? What was our thinking? When we were students, what were our challenges? How did we participate in the liberation struggle from our different backgrounds? And I also mention it because I was volunteer number 8,432 or something. And volunteer number one was a certain Nelson Mandela. He wasn't yet Nelson Mandela. He was just Nelson Mandela, the law partner of Oliver Tambo, middle ranking, quite prominent people. He could make some money as a lawyer. He couldn't open his office in the white part of town. He had to carry a pass, he couldn't vote, but he could make some money and he was giving up the chances of at least living fairly comfortably, voluntarily to go to jail for the rights of his people. And I put the question sometimes, what was the one good thing that apartheid did? And I see the audience getting a little bit nervous. Am I going to do Helen Zilla on you? (laughs) The one good thing apartheid did was to create anti-apartheid. It enabled L.B. Sachs growing up in a cosmopolitan family, Jews who'd fled from the pogroms, the massacres in Lithuania every Easter. The Cossack troops would come into the little villages and say the Jews killed Christ, we're going to kill the Jews. And my grandparents would hide in the forest, would hide in the basements. So they fled. They came to South Africa. My dad became a trade union organizer. My mother would say to me, my little brother, tidy up, tidy up, Uncle Moses is coming. And Uncle Moses wasn't Moses Levine or Moses Kantarovich. Uncle Moses was Moses Kutani, General Secretary of the Communist Party. So I grew up in that kind of a world. And now they're calling for volunteers, and I want to volunteer, and I volunteered. And I meet, in the course of that struggle, people like Oliver Tambo, who became the biggest influence, possibly, of all anybody on my life, Nelson Mandela, a common hatred of racism, of oppression, of exploitation. I fast forward to 1988. I'm working in Mozambique. It's the People's Republic of Mozambique. It's the time of the revolution in Mozambique. And it's April the 7th, 
1988, the day of the Mozambican woman. That was the day in which Josina Michel died. She'd been married to Samora Michel, and she'd insisted that women had the right to bear arms to fight. And there were conservative forces inside Frelimo who said, no, the men do the fighting in our culture, the women support the men. And she said, no, I want to take part in the nation's highest ambitions. I want to be a soldier. She became a soldier. She didn't die in combat, but she became a hero. And it's the day of the Mozambican woman, and we have day, morning off, and I'm off to the beach, and poof, Total, total, total darkness. I know something terrible is happening to me. I don't know what it is. And I hear a voice saying, Albi, you're in the Maputo Central Hospital. This is Eva Garrido speaking. Your arm is in lamentable condition. And I say into the darkness, what happened? And a woman's voice said it was a car bomb. I faint back into darkness, but with a sense of joy. That moment that every freedom fighter is waiting for, will they come for me? Will they come for me today? Will I be brave? They'd come for me, they tried to kill me, and I had survived. I felt joyous. And I knew I was in the hands of Frelimo, not kidnapped, thrown into jail in South Africa. Some time passes. I'm feeling very light. I'm lying on my back. My eyes are covered. And I tell myself a joke. It's about Jaime Cohn, who, like me, is a Jew. He falls off a bus and he does this. An old joke. And somebody said, Jaime, I didn't know you were Catholic. What do you mean Catholic? Spectacles, testicles, wallet and watch. <laughs> He's checking. And for some reason, I started with testicles. <laughs> and I've tried all my life to be macho. And I've never succeeded except for 15 minutes afterwards. The word went round the camps. The first thing Comrade Albi did was reach for his balls. <laughs> Seemed to be in order. Wallet, my heart, is that okay? No damage there. My brain, that's very serious. Spectacles. There was a crater, but no damage. Watch. I've lost an arm. I've only lost an arm. And I had a total conviction that as I got better, my country would get better. That was April 1988. And we come back to South Africa. We told comrades, we must be disciplined. Uh, we mustn't just rush back to the country. Await instructions. You could await instructions. I could still be waiting for instructions if I'd waited for instructions. And a certain professor, Dalla Omar, head of the Community Law Center at the University of the Western Cape, says, Comrade Albi, can you come back quickly? We want to discuss the making of a new constitution for South Africa. So it wasn't Comrade Dalla Omar asking Comrade Albi, because then you have to go through all the different processes. Just Professor Dalla Omar asking Professor Albi. So I'm not undisciplined, I come back. And I stay with him and Farida. I arrived on a Saturday. I climbed Table Mountain the first day. I didn't know if I could do it. A very easy way up the back, right round the top. And the second day, I'm speaking on this platform. I've just come back after 24 years of exile, but I feel I'm at home. I'm at home because UWC was the center of struggle. It was powerful, emotional, united, intellectual, critical, people linking together. I just felt marvelous here. And more than that, I joined the Community Law Center at UWC, and UWC was the engine room of our constitution making. It's a story going around that Mandela got together with de Klerk and they did a deal. You can get the vote, but don't touch the economy. Okay, let's get our lawyers to make a constitution. Wrong, wrong, 
wrong, wrong. We had six years of battle, breakdowns, massacres, completely different conceptions of the new South Africa. And the Community Law Center was at the heart of conceiving of a non-racial, non-sexist, democratic South Africa with majority rule, which meant rule overwhelmingly by black people in South Africa to bring about transformation and change and protections coming to people not because they're majority or minority or black or white or brown, because they're human beings. And we had to fight against the idea of three presidents. It's completely forgotten today. We would have had Mandela on Monday, De Klerk on Tuesday, Butelezi on Wednesday. I'm actually lying. It would have been one year, one year, one year for each. And they'd have to rule by consensus. And that would have been fantastic for the whites as it would have given them a veto. The struggle over the Constitution was the struggle against a white minority veto and protections for human beings against abuse of government through an entrenched Bill of Rights, <coughs> fundamental rights for everybody because they're human beings, and including social and economic rights and opening the door for economic transformation. That was our struggle, and that struggle in intellectual terms was pioneered here at UWC. The Center for Development Studies, UWC organization, established workshops we had on the electoral system, workshops on should we have a constitutional court, should we have social and economic rights, the land issue, we had three workshops, and the people participating were activists. They'd come off the island. They'd been in the underground, in the resistance. Even those of us lawyers had been in the struggle. I'd been blown up. Others had been in jail. And we wanted a constitution for a new, transforming, united South Africa. And UWC was the place. And I'd already chosen UWC because after I was blown up, and I end up in hospital in London. Artwork in Mozambique by the great artist Malangatana, Shisano and others were in my apartment there. You couldn't get bread, you couldn't get chicken, you couldn't get butter, but you could buy beautiful art. The artist never stopped in the midst of the war, the civil war, and I had beautiful artwork. And I had to decide what to do with it. And I thought, I can't leave it in Mozambique. They've got their own art. If I take it to England, the artwork is in exile with me. I'm going to send it to South Africa. But I didn't want to send it to the National Gallery. Where to go? UWC. University of the Western Cape. It's in the library. It's not properly displayed. All my documents and papers are in the Maibuya Center. Now they've been digitized. It only took 25 years. So maybe in another 25 years, the artwork will be properly displayed. And it's artwork from a time of revolution, of struggle, of civil war, of suffering. Very, very beautiful artwork. And it belongs in UWC. So these are some of the traditions, if you like, of struggle on this campus and by this campus for the nation. And those of you who take part in these programs, in a sense, are part and parcel of that ongoing, ongoing tradition. Let me move forward to the specific issue of media freedom. Very hotly contested these days. I'm now Judge Albie Sachs on the Constitutional Court of South Africa. And we had two important cases. The one is the case of Kumalo versus Holomisa. I'm not sure if it's Holomisa versus Kumalo. Everybody knows Holomisa, not everybody knows Mr. Kumalo. And the issue was in relation to 
if the press prints a story about somebody and it turns out that it's mostly true but some of it's untrue, the law as it was, the old common law, Roman Dutch law, said the press has to pay up damages. And there was a very famous case in the United States, New York Times versus Sullivan, where the US Supreme Court came out strongly for their First Amendment. Freedom of speech, freedom of freedom of speech, particularly in relation to public figures. And that case had a special history because in the United States, in the southern states, where they had their own judges and juries, if there were any rebel movements, any opposition movements, saying bad things, the governor did this, that and the other, if they made the tiniest mistake, it could be 95% true, but 5% they got it wrong. The governor would go to court and sue and get huge sums of damages because the white juries were protecting white racial supremacy. And the Supreme Court said no. If you're in public life, in the, gov in the government, you've got to take it on the chin. If people say falsehoods about you, too bad. The political process must be the answer. And the question was, should we in South Africa go as far as the First Amendment to the United States. And we said, we go quite a big distance. We used to have censorship. The New Age newspaper, not the New Age newspaper of two years ago, the New Age newspaper of the 1950s, which followed on The Guardian and Advance in People's World, the government would ban it. We'd come up with new same newspaper, but with new editors. I was even editor for a couple of weeks. And we reported the struggle. And those editions now are collector's items, and historians get more information from them than they do from all the official journals and newspapers, big commercial newspapers. And the journalists were in the front line Governor Mbeki was the reporter from Port Elizabeth, the most active part of our struggle. 25 years on Robben Island. Ruth First was head of the office in Johannesburg. She was blown up and killed in Maputo. Her body is still there. We sang so many songs to so many people and we buried. And each time we'd wonder, there's still some space in this cemetery, will I be the next one? Joe Kabi, who worked as assistant to Ruth, assassinated by South African hit squads in Harare. People died. People died. We don't want people to die for their beliefs today. You can make an investment of your life, your liberty, But you don't need to die. We've got a constitution. We've got rights. We've got a voice. We can speak. We can mobilize. We can organize. We can vote. We can go to court. But it's a serious business. Truth is a serious thing. The other case we had was the Islamic Unity radio case. Very, very sad case where a guy came from England and he spoke very critically about Israel and he had every right to do that, every right to do that on a date commemorating the establishment of Israel. But he went on to say, it's not true that six million Jews died. It was only one million and they died of starvation. Now, in Germany, if you say that, that's called Holocaust denial, you go to jail. In America, you can say that. The courts have said it's okay. Not okay, it's not, not something we like, but freedom of speech, freedom of speech. And we were asked to rule on the community radio being sanctioned for broadcasting. 
But in the end, we decided that the regulations were far too wide and far too sweeping. We didn't have to get to the actual case. I don't know how we would have decided on the substance, the merits of the case. But Pius Langer, who went on to become Chief Justice, wrote, saying how important freedom of speech is in this country, where the ma majority of people were denied their right to speak, their voice, the right to be heard, the right to contribute, to debate, to argument, everything. Very powerful, very important. But at the same time, we're a country where race has been used to deny people their dignity, where speech can wound and harm and destroy the humanity of those affected by it, particularly those who belong to sections of the community that historically had their grandparents and great-grandparents subjected to gross, gross indignities and indignities which correspond to fault lines of race in our country today, inequalities in our country today. And so when I go to the United States, I say we don't allow hate speech in South Africa. Whatever your First Amendment says. And just two days ago, Justice Mojapelo said flying the old South African flag amounts to hate speech. The argument was it's not speech. He said speech isn't just words in our constitution. It's expression. Flying the flag is a powerful form of expression. And then there's talk in the Constitution about non-protection of speech if it's calculated to cause harm. But does the harm have to be physical violence? I'm inciting somebody to hit you because you grew up in the Cape Flats? Or can harm be harm to your dignity, your standing, your sense of moral worth? And more and more the courts are saying harm can come simply by using the K-word, whether it's insulting history, it's defamatory implications. It's not just a negative, ugly word. It's a word loaded with pain and historical meaning. Well, that's the context in which you're working. I'm not going to involve myself in the huge debates that are going on now about matters, many of which are before the courts. The courts will deal with them. My colleagues will deal with them. I'm a superannuated judge, uh, and I don't want to tread in their area. But it has been mentioned how important the social media have become. And I was working recently with the Human Rights Commission on the whole question of should there be a law that criminalizes hate speech and everybody agrees, if hate, hatred induces a crime of beating a woman to death because she's not sufficiently woman, that aggravates the crime terribly. It's not just the particular victim that's being attacked, it's everybody of a different sexual orientation. And if other crimes are actuated by hate, then that should be an aggravating factor for greater punishment. But if there's no other crime other than the hate speech itself, should that be a criminal offence? And my proposal was, we've got to be careful about trying to use the law, it's a very blunt instrument, to solve huge cultural problems in our society, problems of education values. At the same time, we can't just allow things to pass. And maybe we need to develop a process of where people engage in speech of that kind, you can get a restraining order against them if they continue, that becomes the crime. But there are different ways of looking at these things. The last point I want to make is, in addition to social media, leaks. And the use of leaks. I only wish I only wish when we had the drought here in the Western Cape, we'd had all those leaks, we could have filled all the dams <laughs> to 90% with the leaks. But they're creating serious new problems because they're selective. You can't cross-examine, you can't test. And they encourage manipulation and secretive 
secretive things. I think, and I would just urge those of you who are working as journalists here at UWC, in that sense, be old-fashioned, have sources, check your sources, get verification, look at the context, follow what we decided in the Kamalo and Hulamisa case where we said we want open, challenging media, examining power, unafraid, but you can't be reckless. If you make a mistake, and you might make mistakes, we've got to live with it. The person's concerned we've got to live with it. But you must take reasonable steps to verify. You must take reasonable steps. So there's an onus on journalists to show integrity, not to go for the headlines, not to be swept away by their own prejudices, to check, to check, to check. Take reasonable steps. If you've taken reasonable steps and you make a mistake, you get it wrong, you won't be penalised. But if you don't take reasonable steps and you say something wrong, then you can be in trouble. Okay, good luck to all of you. It's fantastic for me to reconnect with that younger Albie Sachs who came here, stood on this platform reconnected with my country after 24 years of exile. It's wonderful to see this attentive audience with big eyes, wondering who this guy is, wondering maybe when is he going to stop, <laughs> which I can answer very, very quickly right now. Thank you. <laughs>